Hi everybody, welcome back to Agitated APF channel. It's again mail opening time here, thanks to Julian from the UK that sent me a very appreciated box full of chips. I decided, however, not to show the original footage of the box opening, since I had not removed the mail label. The first thing I found in the box is a tube full of 4164 dynamic RAM chips, suitable, for example, for C64 repairs. In the end, however, the box contained quite a lot of interesting items. These three ICs are 27C512 windowless EEPROMs, so they can be programmed only once, but not erased. Then Julian sent four crystals, cut for 17.7347 MHz, suitable as a replacement for C64 PAL boards. And these are MOS 8701 oscillator ICs used on the later C64 revisions and in the C128. This bunch of chips are programmable logic devices intended as a superior replacement for the 22V10 and 18V8 type of PALs. These are clearly programmed parts, but these chips are electrically erasable so they can be very useful for prototype and repair projects. These are Chemic branded PLS100 PLA. Julian sent them to see if these are maybe blank PLAs that can still be programmed, for example to make a new C64 PLA replacement. So this will be the first thing that I'll check later in this video. However, these were not all the parts that Julian donated. I was astonished to find not just one, but six total seed chips. Wow! That's a great gift indeed. They are three old seed revision, 6581, all with a 1984 date code, 168R4AR with a 1986 date code, and two new seed revision, 8580R5, both with the Commodore Semiconductor Group logo, and one of them has a 1989 date code, and the other instead was made in 1990. This donation left me speechless, really. I can now complete my C64 revision A PCB and have spares for all my C64. To read the PLS100 chips, I use my Data IO 2900 device program, which is executing the self-test right now. Now I'm selecting the manufacturer and the part number of the device. But on Temic manufacturer list, there is no PLS100 device. So I select the Philips PLS100, which is the closest one. Then I simply try a blank check to see if the device is already programmed. Very interesting, we get a device in session warning. Let's try with another one. Hmm, the same warning again. 
Let's try the last I see then. All of these I see show just the same warning. Let's see what this warning means for the program. Basically, the warning should appear when the device isn't making proper contact in the socket, but I can exclude this case because all chips show the same warning and they have shiny pins anyway. The help screen also suggests to try disabling the continuity checks, so let's do this. With continuity checks disabled, we now get a device of a current fault. This error has one likely explanation. It means that these ICs do not have all the high voltage fuse read and programming circuitry, but probably are just must program devices that have the same gate structure of a PLS100. So, these are not blanks, but in a way, these are not even programmable parts. I will now try to read the ICT programmable logic devices using again the Data IO 2900 program. So I select the 18CV8 device type and I attempt to read the diffuse map first. Now let's visualize the fuse map. It seems that either the device is unprogrammed or a copy protection fuse is enabled. So let's try a blank check now. Since we get a non-blank result, it means this device is already programmed and cannot be read. However, it can be programmed again when needed as it is electrically erasable. To check the quartz crystals like these ones, I've made a few years ago a simple tester circuit. When the red LED lights, it means the quartz is correctly oscillating. So, all of these quartz are working fine. I have reverse engineered the schematic of that little tester, since I haven't found any copy of that circuit. It is a very simple one, so let's see how it works. The first transistor works as a simple voltage stabilizer. It is an emitter follower trying to keep its emitter about 0.6 volts below its base, which is fixed at 10 volts by the zero diode. This diode simply avoids any damage if I connect the supply power with the wrong polarity. The second transistor is the actual oscillator. The capacitor values are chosen to allow the oscillation of any quartz cut with a frequency higher than 1 MHz. I have used a VHF transistor here, an SS1918, but this is probably an overkill. The first one nanofarad capacitor brings a sample of the oscillator waveform to a rectifier made with a two 1N4148 diodes and a second 1 nanofarad capacitor. So, if the oscillation is present, there is a DC voltage on the base of the last transistor. 
I've also added another small 47 picofarad capacitor to connect an oscilloscope probe should I want to measure the oscillation frequency. This last transistor is a simple on-off switch that allows a current through the LED when the base is polarized by the rectified oscillator waveform. In the end, this is a very easy but useful circuit to make if you have a large collection of old crystals. To test the MOS 8701 clock generator ICs, I'll use one of my C64 boards. If the machine powers up correctly, it means that the two output clocks of this chip are working fine. This is the first one. It has the new Commodore Semiconductor Group logo and it was made in 1990. So let's try to power the C64 on. And it's a good working one indeed. Here is the second one. It was made in 1989. It has the new CSG logo too. Let's try to power on. And even this one is perfectly working. Many thanks again, Julian. I still can't believe I have six bar signals. So it's time to test them all. For the tests, I use the Seed Tester program. A link to its download it is in the video description. I'll test the 6581 12V seeds in a Bradbin C64 PCB. Since these boards were meant for 12V seeds and VIC2 chips, I will also first record the test output of the resident seed of this board. This is a 6481 R4AR with a 4486 date code. The newer 8180 9V seeds will be tested on a C64C motherboard. I will of course record the output of this board original seed, an 8180R5 with 1689 date code. I won't show all the complete recordings in this video, since has not even recorded them with enough audio quality, but I've linked in the video description this program auto our own video that shows a complete test run.
With one of the 6581s, I could finally complete my NTSC Revision A C64 PCB, so I'm very happy. And that's all for this video. I hope you find it interesting and that you learned something. If you have any question, please use the comment section. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.